Good morning, Edge Hill people. This is the fifth Sunday of Easter. I am in St. Petersburg, Florida, visiting my oldest son, Rush. Johnny Mac and I drove down with Johnny Mac's dog this past week to spend some time with him and Hannah, my youngest daughter, who also lives here. I want to ask you, as we enter into this worship service, to be in prayer for Ted and Woodley McEachin. Um, they've been on our prayer list for quite a while, but this past, uh, or actually yesterday, last night, Ted took a fall um, and is in surgery as I record this message. He is having, uh, he has a broken hip, so he's having hip surgery to repair that. And um, at his age, you know, going under anesthesia and having the surgery, it's a little frightening. So we want to tie all of our prayers together for the McEachern family. They're an important part of the body of Christ known as Edge Hill. So now I invite you to prepare for worship. Breathe deeply the Holy Spirit, and let's turn our, high, high, uh, our hearts and our minds toward God. Amen. Good morning, Edge Hill. My name is Dan McEachern. I, probably most of you have no earthly idea who I am. I'm a first service person, so therefore I've probably not had a lot of interaction with, with some of you. But uh, I'm here this morning to, first of all, I want to thank uh, John and Steve and Nancy and all the others that have been putting these uh, lessons together for us on Sunday mornings. You know, we Edge Hillians are big huggers. And that's not the same not to be able to do that. But at least we know that we all have a common thought each, each day that we can focus on. I'm here this morning to announce to you that Reverend John Philhacker, our current pastor, is going to be returning to us for another year. He'll be, that'll be, the appointment will be from July 1st, 2020 until June the 30th, 2021. The council and, and the rev and the bishop have worked very, very hard this year to make the to try to make the right choices for the right places. I know they've worked very hard. I've gotten enough phone calls back and forth uh, about it, so I know that they have not been playing around. They have been working, and uh, they saw felt that John was the person that we needed for another year, and we welcomed him to stay and we're glad to have him. John's worked very hard. He came from West End, who, which is a very different type of church, very different atmosphere from what HL is, where you have to know everything that's going on and participate in, in everything. Uh, John's made headway with the pastors in the community, with the community groups. Uh, and of course he has given Nancy all the support that he can with her work in the community and uh, which is vital to Edge Hill and it's our signature uh, community program of course but I hope all of us will will welcome John back personally let him know we're glad he's going to be here again and thank him for the things that he's done for us in the past now, the, the bishop asked those of us who are uh, making these announcements today to read this prayer, and I will read it for you. Lord Jesus Christ, our living Savior, we give you thanks for our church. It is a gift of grace to us. We are deeply grateful for the leadership of John Feldhacker, who will continue to serve us as pastor, teacher, leader, and friend in Christ. May your grace be upon him and his family giving peace and joy and confidence as we begin this new conference year together. Open our hearts and minds to receive the gifts you have for us in these days as we give thanks for what has been and anticipate what will be. Our life is in you, O oh God, and through the Holy Spirit we pray this day. Amen. And welcome back, John. Thank you very much.
Good morning, Edge Hill. Would you join me in our call to worship? The Lord is our refuge. We can find peace in God's abiding love. When troubles assail us, we call upon the Lord. When joys abound, we call upon the Lord. Welcome this day to God's house, one of many dwellings of the Almighty One. Will you join me now for our prayer of confession? Must we see you in order to believe you, Lord? Is seeing truly believing? Are we to be prisoners of our senses, distrusting and rejecting whatever we cannot see, touch, or hear? Yet you are faithful. You give sight to the blind. You carry us when we are weary. You call us by your side. The locked room of our hearts opens at the turn of your key. Speak your words of life to us again. Do not doubt, but believe. Speak your words of life that we might live. The peace of God be with you. Receive God's forgiveness and the promise of the Spirit, for Jesus is risen from the dead. Seen or unseen, he is present in our midst, and we see the presence of Christ reflected in each other's faces. Let us pray. Almighty God, help us to live in a world where all people are treated equally and with dignity, where we don't play with the lives of the people to fulfill our own selfish desires, where we as all people are united to help each other as brothers and sisters in humanity. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. In addition to the prayer concerns that will follow in this video, please remember Ted McEachern and Woodley and the family.
in their care for him with his hip repair surgery. Our scripture reading today is John 14, 1 through 14. Today's reading is known as Jesus' farewell discourse. It is where he prepares his disciples for his fast approaching departure. John adjusted today's text using more gender inclusive language because it contained quite a few traditional male pronouns for God. The gender inclusive translation simply better honors the vast vastness and mystery of God. With that being said, John 14, 1 through 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In God's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? 
and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God except through me. If you know me, you will know our God also. From now on, you do know God and you have seen God. Philip said to him, Lord, show us God and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Lord. How can you say, show us God? Do you not believe that I am in God and God is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own. But God who dwells in me does great works. Believe me that I am in God and God is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, will do greater works than these, because I'm going to the Lord. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that many, so that God may be glorified in me. If in my name you ask for anything, I will do it. I've been in Florida for a few days this past week to visit my oldest son and my youngest daughter. They live in St. Petersburg. So this last week, Johnny Mac and I drove down with his puppy, Archer, to spend some time. Purely by coincidence, Edge Hill members John and Martha Horrell also have a place here in St. Petersburg. So on this, my last day in town, They've treated us for an afternoon on the water. Being on or near the water provides us with a unique and beautiful perspective on creation. It's so fresh and vi vibrant and filled with life and energy. It's a great place to reflect on today's reading. If you think about it and you're at the ocean, it seems to call to us, doesn't it? It sings a song very similar to Jesus' message in today's reading, when Jesus says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Near the water, we sense the mystery of God. We become more aware of the depth and the breadth of God's presence in all creation. And we feel loved. Since I've been down here, each day I've enjoyed watching the playful dolphins and other marine mammals in the bay and over in the ocean. They simply are doing what they tend to do so effortlessly. That is, join together in community and swim in pods and breathe and play and jump. Entranced by these intelligent air-breathing creatures, I noticed that no matter how long they can stay underwater, they eventually have to return to the surface to breathe. And no matter how long they're on the surface, they have to go back into the deep to feed and nourish themselves. It's how they restore and renew their very physical bodies. It is this pattern of living this seems very similar to how we should live our lives as Christ followers. We need both the nourishing depth of solitude and the contemplation and reflection, as well as living within a spirit-filled community in order to live healthy and balanced lives, because we need both as human beings, highly spiritual animals. 
When enjoying the depth of solitude, we begin to see and better understand the mystery of God. We hear the silence and the natural rhythms of the sea and the waves and the birds and the wind blowing through the trees. And there's no question, we're spiritually fed, we're nourished. When we, whenever we notice nature and we commune with it. But when we stay there too long, we begin to hunger for community the community to give us what we need and miss our relationships, our life and our activities together. But when we surface and spend all of our time in community, we begin to hunger for the depth and the nourishment that can only come from solitude and silence. And we begin to miss our time of quiet reflection and spiritual nourishment. So we need the balance of both solitude and belonging to a loving community to travel our journeys in healthy ways. We need both. Like dolphins, we need both to nourish ourselves in the deep of contemplation and reflection and to restore our hearts and souls by swimming in community. It doesn't matter how much you enjoy the depth of solitude. Even when you are so completely intoxicated by it, you can't stay underwater for too long or you'll eventually drown. We have to break the surface to breathe and live in the world and in healthy, balanced community. But if we love our worldly relationships and communities too much and we never want to be alone, will also starve to death because we'll lack the spiritual nourishment that can only be gained from the depth of solitude. Just a reflection for this week, and I want you to keep that in mind as we explore the rest of today's reading. It begins with some of the most comforting words in all of Scripture. Do not let your hearts be troubled. But, as you probably noticed, these comforting words are followed up by some of the most troubling words that an open and loving congregation like Edgehill can hear. The words that have been used to exclude people. When Jesus says, no one comes to God except through me, we wonder and we kind of shake our heads because we know how often people have appropriated these words in ways that have caused pain and suffering in our world. We know this ever so painfully, as we've seen many preachers rail against those who don't believe exactly the way they believe. And they're preaching the message that unless they do, they're all going straight to hell. We recognize this as very dangerous and mean-spirited theology. God is simply so much bigger than any fear-based approach to the good news will ever be. Today, I thought it was important to deal with this troubling verse, verse so it won't keep us from experiencing the incredible comforting message in today's reading. To frame this, we have to look at the context. As Jesus is preparing his closest followers for his departure, for his death, his execution, they were more than a little confused about what he was saying. So he goes on to explain to them that he is going to God's house to make a place for them there as well. As the disciples are trying to absorb this, Jesus tells them they already know the way to God. They already know the way to the place that he is going. You can just see the disciples trading glances at one another, shrugging their shoulders, kind of going, huh? So the wise one, the doubting one, Thomas, asked the question they were all thinking about. Lord, we are confused. We don't know where you are going. How could we possibly know the way? Now, this part, we have to remember Jesus is speaking directly to his closest followers as they are about to face the largest challenge they will face in all of the New Testament. 
his arrest, death, execution. But his message that sounds so exclusive and divisive to us that the only path to God is through me. It's true for the disciples in their time, in their place, because for them, the only path to God was through Jesus. At that time in history, in their context, yes, it was true because they were Jesus's closest followers. And he was right in front of them. And they were experiencing God's love through Jesus the Christ. But thankfully and importantly, those were not the last words God spoke on this subject. God has continued to speak to us throughout the ages to consistently broadening, consistently broaden understanding of how God's love works. God has consistently been reaching out to love some of those people, some of the most unexpected people out there. In fact, God continues to speak to us and through us up to this very moment. Think about it. We all have to, we all have experienced God's love and compassion and mercy through so many of our brothers and sisters from the other world religions beyond Christianity. And we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they are also beloved children of God, every bit as much as we are, every bit as much as those dolphins breathing in the Holy Spirit each time they break the surface of the ocean. God loves everyone unconditionally. We're all part of God's creation, all of us, regardless of the words we use, or regardless of the words other people use to describe their God and what it is they believe. Regardless of the way God created us as gay or straight, male or female, light-skinned or dark-skinned, left-handed or right-handed, or even if they ended up being Democrat or Republican, or any of the other divisive labels humanity has used to separate people, God loves and works through all of us. So for us, like the early disciples, we're Christian. This means we've given ourselves to God and we've pledged our lives to the teachings of Jesus and joined eternally to the Christ in the waters of our baptism. Here's the most important part of all of that is that Jesus Christ does not belong to us. We belong to Christ. We are God's. God is not ours. Christ doesn't belong to us to be used as a weapon to win an argument, to gain more control, to grow a congregation, or to make us feel better about ourselves. We are God's, and God's promises include us, but they're not limited to us. And we are called to share this message of love, not to control it nor to have the arrogance to think we can limit how God loves and whom God loves. How God works is so far beyond our human understanding, it's comical. It requires humility and openness. And the incarnation means that God's love is in all of us, the same way it was in Jesus. So all of us, despite our brokenness, are God's own self-expression because we're created in God's image, but it's so much more. And that's why Jesus tells his disciples that if they can't accept what he says, then they need to look at what it is he teaches and how he teaches. And they had seen him teach by sharing God's love with so many unexpected people. Hear that part again. They had seen the love that he shared with the most unexpected of people. And I think that's what the Christian movement should look like even through to this day. And that's why Jesus continues teaching by saying, together you will do even greater things than I have done. Empowered by the incarnate love of God, you'll also do the things that I do. And in fact, will do even greater things than it's because I'm going to God 
And from there, I will empower you through the Holy Spirit to do even greater things than I do. They're never self-serving things because they all must be grounded in the defining nature of God, and that is love. That's where we find our nourishment. That's where we breathe in the Holy Spirit. It's when we're loving and serving others. It's the promise God gives to the body of Christ as a community of people who believe in the power of love. So do not let your hearts be troubled. Amen. Hey again. So earlier this week, I was talking with a friend about church and how much we miss church right now um, in our current um, pandemic, social distancing world. And we were talking about how really one of the things that we miss the most about church right now is the socialization and the support that we get when we're in the church building and interacting with one another. Being spiritually fed is very important. And I think that's the foundational reason why we come to church. But when I think about the things that I love the most about coming to church, it's a chance to nourish the relationships that I have there. I feel like we all get so much support from Edge Hill um, being a part of this family. We are comforted in times of pain. We are prayed for in times of need. We're supported in other ways when we are in need. We're celebrated and loved when the joyful times of life come through. And now is the time of our service that we can give back to the church and support them in kind financially. So I ask for you to prayerfully consider how you can give back to Edge Hill in the form of our offering today. Following this video will be instructions on how you can give digitally to our church. Thank you. I invite you now to receive this benediction. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Go into the world, breathe deep the Holy Spirit, experience God's love through one another, and be at peace. Amen.